feel like you've already been welcomed, but I want to welcome everyone again. Uh, this is uh, this is what we do. We gather on Sunday and we worship. This is, you know, this is not the sum total of your Christian life, obviously. You're out there hopefully seven days a week, living like Jesus, treating people the way Jesus would treat people, and uh, representing Him in this world. But this is something that we do that we can't do alone. We can't gather, we can't lift our voices uh, without each other. We need each other for this. This rips me up. This charges our batteries. This is why we're here. Uh, first time guests, please uh, scan the QR code. Can't really do an announcement without mentioning a QR code anymore. Um, and uh, and we, wanna, we wanna just call everyone to join us in worship now. There is an endless song echoes in my soul. I hear the music ring. And though the storms may come, I am holding on. And to the rock I cling. How can I keep singing your praise? God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of God of Abraham. For the kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. You notice that there's not a praise team behind me here today. As I look around through the audience, I don't see any of the people who are usually on the praise team. <laughs> so I think that's, I think that's probably why. Um, but I'm only singing alone until all of you open your mouths. So uh, hopefully I'm not alone up here because we're all just singing together. Uh, this song, this song is a, a, a wonderful song that, t that to me uh, gets its origin in Philippians 2, uh, where Paul talks, it gives us a hymn about how Jesus uh, had this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider that something to be grasped onto and held onto. You know, we fight over our little crumbs down here on this earth. And Jesus had everything. He was, he was God. He is God. And he didn't consider that something to clinch and hold on to. Man, I don't want anybody to take this away from me. I can't give this up. Jesus let it go. He let it go. And he came down here and he lived like us. 
He actually lived worse than any of us live. He didn't have what we have. And he gave it all up for us. And now God has given him a name that is above all. Jesus is above all. His name is above every name because of what he did and because of who he is. So I want to think about that as we sing this song. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began.
was really thinking about that and that affected me and if you know anything about North Korea you know that that is only a glimpse of some of the horrible things that go on and it made me think of the way we view suffering. We, we've all suffered different things, but for someone so young and so small and so innocent to suffer for the name of Christ impacted me greatly. You know, the Bible talks a lot about suffering for, for Christ. I just wanted to read just a couple, uh, three verses from 2 Corinthians. Paul saying, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. What, you know, Bob was saying we're clenching onto so many crumbs, and th these people, this two year old boy, is already learning from a young life that there's, there's, a, uh, there's something more than the crumbs, and, and he's learning that the very, very hard way. It, it moved me to see how hard that government is on Christians, and yet somehow they're still there. They're still around, and they still have faith. And when things are pressing us, and when things are pressing them, and they still find a way to have faith and believe, uh, man, it, it really puts me in perspective. So I know Jesus says, blessed are those who suffer in my name. Man, that just that boy, that that family in general has blessed me already. Uh, thinking about them, uh, me worrying about my crumbs that I'm holding on to, uh, it's affecting me. So if you would bow with me in prayer, God, you love dearly each and every soul, and every every body, every every boy, every girl that uh, is on this earth. God, you care deeply for that family. And so God, uh, their message and their, their faith has impacted me and I know it's impacting many other Christians in this nation. It's hard for us to understand when Paul says he considers it an honor to suffer for your name. Some of us don't know what that's like, but we look to these families and we have hope and we have uh, we have perspective and they strengthen us. And so God, I ask that you, that you cast your hand of protection over these families and over all the Christians in North Korea and all the things that they face. God, it's, it's unimaginable for us, but God, you can imagine it. You, you see it every day. We just ask that uh, you strengthen us as you strengthen them and that uh, you help us see that we are one and that we don't have to fight over these crumbs, that we can just look to you for our hope. It's in your name, my friend. Good morning. Good morning. I don't know what your sermon's about today, Ron, but the three of us, Bob and Gunner and myself, could not be more in a line. So I listen to a podcast on Mondays that comes out. It's a Bible project as a podcast comes out every Monday. And right now they're doing a series on uh, the city and what the theological significance of that. They're getting ready to make a video. So uh, uh, the two of them go back and forth. It's been fascinating. Um, for those of you who don't know, the first city was built by none other than Cain after he killed his brother Abel and was exiled. And they talk about how the reason that city was built was even though God said, look, if somebody comes after you, I'm going to avenge you seven times. But he did not trust God enough to, 
protect him. And so he built the first city. And when you think of city in the Bible, the word ear means a walled city. So it's a group of people, you know, it, might, it was not like a giant city necessarily, but they grew over time. But they built these fortifications so they could protect what was theirs, their crumbs, so to speak. They did not believe that God's blessing was big enough to give it to them and everyone else. They wanted to protect what was theirs. And I was thinking to myself a couple of weeks ago, isn't it nice to know we don't have to live in walled cities? And then Monday happened this week. And he proceeded to describe how we still live in walled cities. See, my walls are built with things other than brick and mortar. My walls are built with F-35s, with B-2 bombers and satellites and political structures and Republican and Democratic parties and jobs and 401ks and all the other things that I put my trust in to make sure that my piece of the blessing, which in terms of what God is able to do, my crumbs, I get to hang on to. Monday was rough this week. Today, we get to remember that we don't live in a city with walls. The city we actually live in, the church, the body of Christ, doesn't have walls because it's after everyone to come in because we don't have to protect the blessings that we have because God gives to those to us generously. And he wants us to share with everyone because guess what happens when you share with others? God has the ability to give you an abundance. Okay, I'm not talking about money and all that stuff. It's, it's different than that. When we come before the Lord's table, we remember that it is not the walls that everybody else is concerned with. It is not the crumbs that everyone else is chasing. We have something far greater than that. And so we need to put our hope in Jesus, not in political parties, not in our careers, not in the things that I get to build and design on a daily basis, but we put those in God because that's where it really, that's where everything comes from. Let's pray. God, as we remember Jesus, and as the song says, emptied himself and came to earth and did not regard holding on to you as something to be grasped and held on to, but humbled himself, Father. We just pray that you will help us humble ourselves and let go of the things in our lives that we have built up as walls so that we can let others in to share the blessing that you've given us. Thank you for loving us. It's in Christ's name. Amen. We have tables prepared around the auditorium. If you would like to arise and go, uh, we'll share the emblems there. I believe there's also a few uh, single-use kinds of things out there if you prefer not to be in a large group. So, thank you. Pray for us, too. And we'll pray for you. So, here we go. Let's be standing, please. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first. Chains are gone, I've been 
set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me. Gunner, I, uh, I returned. Where are you at, Gunner? Oh, I lost him. Yeah, I actually returned from South Korea yesterday. And one thing that struck me, the number one tourist thing from Seoul was trips to the demilitarized zone. The giant wall, the giant minefield that separates those two countries. On the subway, they had re recurring videos that showed how to put on your gas mask. That entire part of the world just lives in fear of what may happen next. And so it really struck me, uh, Brian, your comments on the wall and everything else about this morning uh, just really hit me hard. So, pray for me. Father, hear the prayers of your children right now not only here, but around the world, in places where your people are oppressed in fear for their lives because they believe in you. Father, in places that live in fear because of the people that surround them, Father, hear your children. We beg you in Jesus' name. Amen. Is it time for children's worship? Okay. Now it's time for children's worship. So we got a little bowl up here. The way that, the way this goes is they file by and they put money in that bowl. And that helps our friends in South Texas and Haiti. And it makes the kids fully part. You know, they're not the church of the future. They're the church right now, aren't they? Yeah. They're going to go to kids' worship. And we're going to sing one more song. Um, this one's kind of like vacation Bible school to me, BBS. That doesn't stand for a very bad situation. <laughs> It's VBS, so I want everybody to, you know, you're kind of reserved this morning. You haven't had quite enough coffee. We're going to get into this, okay? Uh, I want everybody to sing with me, and let's let's not uh, let's not have any inhibitions. I will call upon the Lord, and that's how I get saved from my enemies, not behind my walls. The Lord saves me, and I think that's going to go on pretty good with our sermon this morning. I will call upon the Lord, who is
know the Lord in heaven, and blessed be the rock, let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord live, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord. You're all right, Ronnie. <laughs> well, Brian, I'll tell you, sometimes the Holy Spirit aligns us. Sometimes. Before I get into the sermon, today on the Christian calendar is Pentecost Sunday. Some of you grew up in, in religious traditions where that was much more significant than the one I grew up in. I never heard of Pentecost Sunday until I got into college. Uh, Pentecost Sunday, however, is important. Let me get you to think back. Think back from our Acts study this year. Think back to Acts chapter 1. Think back to the opening of the book of Acts. Jesus meets the disciples on a mountain. And he tells them... He tells them he's leaving and he gives them some instructions. And there's two things he tells them to do and they're the opposite sides of the same coin. One of them is to stay. Where does he tell them to stay? Anybody? In Jerusalem. Stay in Jerusalem. And the opposite side of the coin is another verb. Anybody else remember what he tells them to do while they're staying? To wait. Yeah, you would think, I, I, I heard somebody say go, because you would think that's the opposite side of the coin from stay. But no, the, the two parts of this coin are stay and wait. And what are they waiting for? The Holy Spirit. Yeah, y'all like, stop being bashful. I know there's not very many people here, and someone's going to know it was you that said something. <laughs> But you guys know this slows me down. I just spent 15 seconds encouraging you to talk to me. So keep talking to the me. The Holy Spirit. Thank you. Amen. The Holy Spirit. I want you to stay and I want you to wait for the Holy Spirit to fall. Now you can decide whether this fits with the sermon and the alignment of, of Gunnar and Brian and, and, and Bob's songs or not. But... I want you to think about Pentecost Sunday on Pentecost Sunday. I want you to remember that the disciples were told to wait for God to send the Holy Spirit, which was the fulfillment of the prophecies of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. When God said, no longer will man teach his neighbor, know the Lord, for they will all know me. I'm going to take out their heart of stone, Ezekiel says. Uh, Ezekiel tells us, God says, I'll take out their heart of stone. I'll give them a heart of flesh. This is the fulfillment, the, the celebration, the remembrance. And on that first Pentecost Sunday in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit, when the disciples had waited long enough and the Holy Spirit arrived, 3,000 souls were baptized. Now, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I wish I had grown up in a church tradition that had said there are special times to get baptized. And I wish someone had said, yeah, it would be cool to be baptized on Pentecost Sunday. So um, the baptistry is clean and it's running. It is not warm. But if you're thinking it might do you some good to suffer for Jesus and you have not been baptized yet, we can help you suffer in cold water. Suffer a new birth. It's 76 degrees in the water. It's 76 degrees in the water. Um, I just want you to think about that. I want, I would really like, I know that, you know, the Christian calendar got out of control in the early centuries and there were, you know, it, 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 almost 300 feast days, right? Out of 365. You get a little tired of it. But I think there's some key elements to the Christian calendar we need to pay attention to. And that may or may not align 
with the sermon. You get to decide. Acts 12 is where we are. And we're going to read the entire chapter today. I read it out loud in time myself. I took my time, read it slowly. Four minutes and 20 seconds approximately to read this whole chapter. So hopefully it won't make this sermon too long. But Acts 12 tells us the story of suffering witnesses. Hello, Gunner. And the fall of a tyrant who persecuted them. It's a careful, if we give it a careful reading, if we pay attention to, to what we're going to read today, this chapter will reveal our proper place, purpose, and posture. Now that sounds like a preacher thing, but I want you to think about those. What is your place in the world as a disciple of Jesus? What is your purpose in the world? As a disciple of Jesus. And what is your posture in the world? Is it to hide behind walls? Right? This is what we're thinking about. And so I think you will find, Brian, things do align this morning. In the sermon workshop on Monday, as we were going through this passage again, um, our new intern, Libby, she's already... She's already vying for best intern ever. I mean, she's like competing. Uh, she joined us in the sermon workshop. She came up with these first two lines. And then the, the group as a whole came up with these last two lines. Herod sits on a throne of darkness. Can I get an amen? amen. Now, there's more than one Herod. Wish I could take some time explaining to you which Herod this is. But guess what? They all sit on a throne of darkness. God sits on a throne of holiness. Can I get an amen for that? Yes. The point of Acts 12, God wins. Amen. So the question that I titled this sermon is, who's in charge? And the answer is God. And if you want to get up and go home now, you've got the sermon. Okay. <laughs> now, I would invite you to stick around and enjoy the story. And the encouragement with the application, if the message is God wins, then the application, the encouragement to you is stay on God's team. Don't get sucked over to the other teams competing for our allegiance in this world. Now that really and truly is the whole sermon, but maybe you'd like to read this story with me, so feel free to stay. About that time, King Herod laid hands it's never an encouraging phrase, is it? Someone laid hands on someone. Laid hands on someone from the church, some from the church to harm them. He had James. So it's not just James. It's some from the church. And he had James, the brother of John, executed with a sword. And when he saw that this pleased the Jews, this man in power, this king in power, Herod, killed one of the apostles, had him executed with a sword. And when he saw that this pleased the Jews, now remember, remember, Luke is not saying every Jewish person in all of Jerusalem was pleased that James was killed. James is using a term, and this is one of those cases where our English translations capitalize it so that we will remember it is a select group in the leadership of the Jews who are vying for power and control of the masses. These Jews, he proceeded, it, it pleased these Jews. And so he proceeded, that is Herod, to arrest Peter too. Because Peter is a significant leader in this new movement of Jesus. And then Luke points out to us, this took place during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Which if you don't remember, or you, and no one's ever told you, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is the seven-day feast that the Jews celebrate every year. It's happening right now in America that ends in Passover. And so Easter and Passover don't always match up. It's, it's okay. We got our calendar messed up a little bit, but Peter is put in prison over Passover. And that's significant. To Luke and so he includes the detail when he had seized him when Herod had seized Peter 
He put him in prison, handing him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him. Herod planned to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison. But those in the church were earnestly praying to God for him. I'm going to pause right here and just point something out. I will call upon the Lord. Right? The church is calling on the Lord. I also want you to think about this. This is not the only parallel, but it's one of many, many parallels of this story and the Exodus story. Remember that God says to Moses when he calls Moses, I've heard my people crying out. And there's a touch point to that story. On that very night before Herod was going to bring him, that is Peter, out for trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains while guards in front of the door were keeping watch over the prison. Now, what is your impression of Peter's likelihood of escape? Zilch. This is a touchstone to the Exodus story because Herod, I mean, Pharaoh has the power to toss their children into the river. He has the authority to send armies in to mow them down. They are trapped in service to Pharaoh. And the possibility of their escape is, is nil. Peter sits in prison, chained between two guards, with guards at the doors. It says they've put four squads of soldiers together to take turns guarding Peter. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the prison cell. He struck, note, note that word, this came out in the sermon workshop, it's fascinating. He struck Peter on the side. He doesn't gently wake him. Bam, Peter, get up. And woke him up saying, get up quickly. And the chains fell off Peter's wrists. The angel said to him, fasten your belt and put on your sandals. And Peter did so. The angel said to him, put on your cloak and follow me. Now, we're going to stop for just a second because I want to talk about the angel. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> an angel of the Lord. The, the article an is not in the text. And it's, it could be appropriate in our English translations. We like articles with our nouns. We like the definite article, the, the angel of the Lord. Or we, if, if in Greek, there's not an indefinite article, so... So it just says angel of the Lord. Um, and maybe that's appropriate, an angel of the Lord. Maybe there's more than one. But here's the deal. I just want you to think about. Starting in Genesis, angel of the Lord. Again, in Hebrew, just angel of the Lord. Starts showing up when Hagar is driven out of the household of Abraham by a jealous wife, Sarai. You remember this story? She goes out in the desert, puts the baby that she's born, given birth to under the bush. She is just going to die. And angel of the Lord shows up and shifts this whole story. Interesting thing about that is she refers to the angel of the Lord, this angel of the Lord, and says, you are Yahweh. You are the Lord. You are. And the Lord says, the angel of the Lord says to her, I am going to do these things for you, speaking as though it is Yahweh. And that is a common theme all the way through every encounter with the angel of the Lord. There is some confusion as to whether it is God, Yahweh himself, or it's an angel it seems to be both all the way through the text. Abraham is about to sacrifice Isaac. And the angel of the Lord shows up and says, Stop, I now know that you honor me. Speaking as though it's the voice of Yahweh. Moses 
happens into a burning bush and this burning bush out of the bush the angel of the lord an angel of the lord this angel of the lord or that's his name angel of the lord speaks to moses out of the bush and they have this interaction where the angel of the lord speaks as yahweh himself balaam and his donkey encounter angel of the lord and then it leaves the torah and it goes into judges and and gideon encounters the angel of the lord and samson's parents encounter the angel of the lord and over and over and over the psalms talk about the angel of the lord the prophets talk about angel of the lord and then we get into the new testament and the angel of the lord shows up with mary and joseph and throughout the gospels and we get into the book of Acts and the apostles encounter angel of the Lord there at the beginning of Acts. And Philip encounters the angel of the Lord. And Peter now encounters angel of the Lord, this time being rescued in Acts 12. And the fourth time, Herod is going to encounter him at the end of Acts 12 in our story today. And this is the last mention of the angel of the Lord. It's very, very interesting. There's a transition going on in this story. Sorry. Got to watch what my hands are doing. There's a transition going on in this story from Peter to Paul. And there's another transition going on in this story from angel of the Lord to Jesus. And I just want, to, I just want you to, to recognize the power of the Holy Spirit working in this situation. This is an important moment for the church. Something significant is happening. And, and the one clue is the appearance of the angel of the Lord. Peter went out and followed him. He did not realize what was happening. By the way, this is a frequent occurrence. The, through the angel, though the, excuse me, that what was happening through the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. After they had passed the first and second guards, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them by itself. Is Peter opening the gates? Is the angel of the Lord opening the gates? Yes. God is moving. Who's in charge? God is. And they went outside and walked down one narrow street when at once the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, am I really awake? He said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from everything the Jewish people, notice the capital, we're talking about a select group, were expecting to happen. When Peter realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark. This is Luke dropping hints for us for upcoming bits of the story. But I want you to notice something. The church in Jerusalem was praying for Peter. Yes? But Peter goes to a church in Jerusalem, the one meeting in Mary's house. I'd like for you to notice that Mary's, this was Mary's church. I'd like for you to notice this was a woman who hosted the church. <clears throat> Many people gathered together and they were praying. Fun, fun story. When he knocked at the door at the outer gate, a slave girl named Rhoda answered, answered. Two important things to remember here. One, or to notice here. One, it's a slave girl who's part of the church. She is part of the fellowship of the church. And she runs, I want you, let me make sure you get that. She's not just working for the owner of the house, Mary. She's actually part of the church because when she hears Peter's voice, she recognizes it and is overjoyed. Are you listening? This woman 
has been with the church praying for Peter. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she did not open the gate, but ran back in and told them that Peter was standing at the gate. The second thing I want you to notice about this story is we human beings believe and express our faith in the work of God in the world, and we are oftentimes surprised when he does what we ask him to do. Yes? I mean, the, God, um, Doug Lawrence has a terrible cancer. It's metastasized into his bones, and it's doctors say he's going to be dead in two years, and we're praying that you'll do something great. And Doug calls me and says, doctor says the cancer's gone. I didn't even do chemotherapy. And I go, wow, God showed up. But they said to her, you've lost your mind. But she kept insisting that it was Peter and they kept saying, oh, well, it's his angel. Now, scholars debate this and I can't settle the debate. I'm not smart enough. Is this, do they mean a supernatural being angel, an angel from heaven? And Peter has his own? First of all, I get why you would think Peter needed his own personal angel. <laughs> Or is this angel just what the word means, a messenger? That Peter has sent a messenger to us from the prison. Because that's what it could mean. It could mean that. And I don't know the answer. I can't solve that problem for you. But I, I will say this. If I thought it was a supernatural being, I would be bolting for the door. I would want to go meet this angel. Right? I mean, you're knocking on the door. I, I want to know what you have to say if it's supernatural. Whatever. Rhoda insists that God has answered their prayers and released Peter from prison. Now I'm going to pause here for just a second. I'm going to tie into something Gunner said to us. Now moved Gunner was to realize a two-year-old boy in, in, a, in a household of faith was suffering for the faith of his parents. And all of us began to ask ourselves a question, I think. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Why do I get to live in a place where there are multiple Bibles in my house and nobody's coming to arrest me? And I'm pretty sure, I, 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 I want to believe as a church that there's not anybody in the room who thinks it's because you are so good and you are God's favorite person. I, I know we got to ask this question and I avoided it at the very beginning because I wanted to get you into the sermon before I ask it. How come James is killed and Peter is rescued? And I can't answer that question for you, but I can make this observation for you. And I hope you'll take this observation with you. The church doesn't ask that question. Why did Peter escape and James die? The church is going to celebrate Peter's escape. And what God has done and is continuing to do. I want to remind you that in Revelation, John sees souls under the altar in heaven. And those souls are the martyred, those who were killed, who were witnesses, killed for their testimony like James. And they are given a white robe and they are given a place of protection and rest. It's after they die. The promise is not that we will all, 100% of us, individually live in security and comfort as long as we 
name the name of Christ. That is not the promise. The promise is some of us will die. Some of us will suffer. Some of our children will be arrested. This will happen to people who follow Jesus. The promise is God will make all of it right. I told Bob I was really wrestling with, I, he, he asked me for some, you know, what's the sermon going to be about? I want to pick songs that fit. And I said, look, the only song that's immediately popping into my head is the song Above All. I love the song Above All. Above all powers, above all thrones, above all the wonders the world has ever known. Jesus Christ is above all of it. I love that. What I don't like about that song is that it, it has this phrase, you took the fall and thought of me above all. And I am uncomfortable saying I am more important than any of you. That God thought of me above all of you. That phrase bothers me. And so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about that. I'm wrestling with it. And then I got to have some conversation with, with uh, Rosemary and Chris Ann and, and um, what's your husband's name, Rosemary? Where'd he go? Oh, they Richard. left. Richard. Richard. I was trying to be funny. Oh, well. um, <laughs> this morning. And I. And, and they, they helped me come up with the best way to say this. I think what the author of that song is trying to say is above all the thrones, above all the powers, above all the North Koreas in the world, all the, all the um, Russias in the world, above all of the dark powers that are working against humans in the world, above all of those, Christ thought of us, a collective me, and what the kingdom of heaven could become. And so, I, you know, I want us to sing that song. I think that song has an important message. I want us to be careful with how we hear our song. I want us to understand that the, what this story is setting up for us as we're going through this struggle and Peter is arrested after James has been killed, is that God is at war with the powers, even the powers behind Herod, not with Herod himself, though if need be, God will deal with Herod. But he gives Herod time. Now, Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door, they saw him. They're greatly astonished. Me too. He motioned to them with his hand to be quiet and then related how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. He said, tell James. Wait a second. I thought James was dead. This is James, the brother of Jesus, not James, the brother of John. Tell James and the, and the brothers these things. He's basically handing off leadership of the Jerusalem church to James. We'll pick up on that again later. And then he left and went to another place. Now, does anybody remember? I know I'm asking a lot of you right now. Anybody remember where Peter came back to Jerusalem from? Where was Peter last time we saw him? Caesarea. Caesarea. He was in Caesarea with Cornelius. Remember? We, we had that whole thing about letting the Gentiles into the church. Peter was in Caesarea. Now, I don't know where Peter goes, but i curious. Did he maybe go back where he had come from before coming to Jerusalem? I'm just curious. Makes me think. Makes me wonder about Luke telling the next part of the story. At daybreak, there was great consternation among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. When Herod had searched for him and did not find him, he questioned the guards and commanded that they be led away to execution. Is Herod looking a lot like Pharaoh? I mean a lot like Pharaoh. This is a man who believes that he has absolute power over the lives of people. That his response to dealing with the escape of this prisoner is to kill his own soldiers. This can never be productive or good. It sets up a temporary 
operation of power. When leaders begin to attack their own people, somebody's going to take that leader out. Does the history of the world teach us this? Yes. And yet, this is the direction Herod goes. Then Herod went down from Judea because anytime you leave Jerusalem, you're going down, even if you're going uphill okay? <laughs> or north. You're just always going down from Jerusalem. Herod went down from Judea to Caesarea, which is north, which is where Peter was last. Don't know. I kind of think it's funny that maybe Peter is going, oh, no. Now he's in Caesarea. He's coming to find me and he's hiding in Simon the Tanner's house. I, I'm making that up. I, I, I'm totally making that up. But it makes me wonder, wouldn't it be cool if Peter is hiding in Simon the Tanner's house while the rest of this story plays out? Now, Herod was having an angry quarrel with the people of Tyre and Sidon. These are cities just north of Caesarea. So they joined together and presented themselves before him. They come down to Caesarea. And after convincing Blastus, the king's personal assistant, to help them, okay, if you're going to do politics, right? If you're going to do politics, you start currying favor with the underlings and get them to talk you up to the king, get every, getting ready for everything. So they buddy up to Blastus. They ask for peace because their country's food supply was provided by the king's country, by Herod's country. On a day determined in advance, Herod put on his royal robes and sat down on the judgment seat and made a speech to them. Right? And what do we do? We make sure all the people who don't like Herod don't make it in for the speech. Right? We want only the people who are going to say good things about Herod. But the crowd begins to shout, the voice of a God and not of a man. Now, I know we never see any of this kind of stuff in American politics, but <laughs> people, people don't worship political power. I, I get that. But, but that's what these people did. And immediately, I, this, this still freaks me out. I'll be honest with you. It kind of bothers me. I don't really like that this happens. Um, and I really don't like the order of the wording that Luke does. But Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck Herod down because he did not give the glory to God and he was eaten by worms and died. It's that eaten by worms and died. I'd rather be dead before the worms start eating. I don't know. I, I, I can't solve some of the problems that part of the story gives me. But here's what I'm getting. The point is, ultimately... God wins. Amen. But the word of God kept increasing and multiplying. So Barnabas and Saul returned to Jerusalem when they had completed their mission, bringing along with them John Mark. Again, setting up more of the story. John Mark's important. He's going to play a part in the story as we go through Acts. Let's think about this for just a second. What is our place? What is our purpose? And what's our posture? Our place is not positions of power. Do you hear me, church? Our place, I'm talking communally, is not positions of power. Will God sometimes put Disciples of Jesus in positions of power. Yes, I'm not saying, I am not saying, please church, I don't like to say I'm not saying, but I want to make sure you understand I'm not saying. A Christian cannot serve in places of power. They can. But it is not our place to hold as the kingdom of heaven. It is not our job to legislate or to control by force this world. That's not our place. Our place is to encourage one another to live out the character and life and teachings of Jesus as a movement of God, as the kingdom of the heavens on earth. Our place is in the kingdom. 
Okay, I think that's a major point in this story. What is our purpose? Our purpose is to invite people into the kingdom and encourage and help each other in the kingdom to live out the teachings, the character, the life of Jesus in this world. Our purpose is to grow the kingdom. We are to be witnesses. This is our job. Yes, church? Yes. yes. And what's our posture? Our posture is not force. It is not violence. Our posture is not to build walls or to hide behind them. Our posture is to invite and to assist and to serve our neighbors and each other. It is to gather in prayer for the Jameses among us who will be executed. It is to gather in prayer for the Peters among us who will be rescued. And it is to continue to increase and multiply our testimony in the world, regardless of how the world responds to us. Yes, church? Yes. I think this is it. So who's in charge? God is. God is. And it's important that we remember this. I have, I, I rearranged my office this week and I threw a whole lot of stuff away. But there's stuff in my office that you would throw away that I won't throw away. And one of them is a little flat river rock that's about this big around. And when Jay Holland was still alive and teaching basic progress, I went through the basic progress course with him. And at the end of the basic progress course, everybody had to bring a gift for everyone else in the basic progress class that you were part of. You had to bring a gift. And the requirement was you could not spend money and you had to make something. So some people made really amazing things and others of us not so amazing things. And one of the people went down to the Trinity River and stole from a park a bunch of flat rocks. And they took a little paintbrush and some gold paint and they painted. God is God and I'm not. And they gave that to us as a gift because that's a major tenet of the basic progress course. That rock still sits in my office. I won't throw away that little rock because I need to be reminded regularly, God is God. I'm not. I don't, I don't need to take his position. I don't fulfill his purposes, his purposes. I fulfilled my purpose that he has given me. And I do not posture myself as being one in authority. God is the authority. This is what I'd like for us to pray about. Take 90 seconds and just process this and ask the Holy Spirit, what do I need to take home? What do I need to focus on this week? As I think about my place, my purpose, in my posture.
Holy Father, be with us. Be with us in our relationships with our neighbors. Be with us in our care for each other. Call us out of our comfort and our security into the work you have prepared for us to do. Help us, Father, to remember the greatest among us will be the servant of all, and that is our place. To remember that our purpose is to invite and share our testimony of the goodness of God in this world, and that our posture is one of kindness and support, not power. Help us, Father, to be your people. We pray through Jesus. Amen. As George is coming up here to read our scripture, I want to say a big thank you to you. Um, some people judge whether a memorial service, a funeral, is successful um, and good by whether or not they messed up or cried or lost control or forgot things or, um, you know, if the pallbearers dropped the casket on the way out of the church, I, you know, there's so many things that we worry and fret about when it comes to a memorial service. But the way I judge a memorial service, especially one that there's a lunch uh, served after, is by how long the family sticks around. And yesterday we had a memorial service for Cap and eight members of his family traveled from as nearby as Keller and as far away as, as um, California. And they came and, uh, and, they, and, we, and we had the memorial service and literally there were less Oak Ridge people finishing up the cleanup than there were family members of CAP because they stayed so long. And the thing they said to me, and this is a compliment to the people who were here, but it's also a compliment to the whole church because this is who you are. What they said to me was, we are so comfortable here and feel so welcomed. And CAP's first wife was here and she said to me, I told my sister and her husband, who live in Keller, they need to start coming to this church. And I looked at her and I said, it's a little far to drive, but you are welcome at any time. And her sister said, my husband's father would have so loved this church. He was part of a church like this. Thank you all for being the kind of church that you are. I'm thanking you passing on the thanks to you for being the kind of church that you are. You do live your place, your purpose, and your posture in this world. Keep it up. George. I'm going to read the uh, white text, and I want you to repeat back nice and strong the yellow, the yellow bubble, okay? As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has arrived. Now, let's try that again. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has arrived. One more time. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has arrived. You're dismissed.